This is going to be a review for exam four over the skeletal system. And my plan for the video is I'm going to spend time going through the information for the lecture part of the exam, the anatomy we've gone through in class, and is you know spelled out and labeled pretty clearly in the notes. So I'm going to leave that for um, you guys to work on your own. That's easier um, if you've got unlabeled images in front of you or come into the classroom to you know, you know, re use the real bones. So um, I'll go through and try to point out some of the most important information as far as um, lecture exam content goes. And I'll just start working through the notes. On this page, the most important thing to note is you should have uh, a pretty thorough list in your mind of everywhere throughout the skeletal system where you would find um, you know, structurally important cartilage. For us, that most me mostly means hyaline and fibrocartilage. Um, elastic cartilage you'll find you know, in the framework of the outer ear, of the oracle of the ear, also in parts of the epiglottis. It's not really skeletal, so we're not going to worry about it. Um, hyaline cartilage, we've mentioned a few specific um, areas like costal cartilage, um, you know, in the ribs, for example. Um, perhaps the most important one to remember, though, is articular cartilage. And it's shown uh, throughout these images, everywhere there's a synovial joint, you should find articular cartilage. All right, what that means is this is cartilage that's covering the surface of um, both bones in a synovial joint. The purpose is, um, number one, mainly to reduce friction. So when those two bones articulate together, you don't want bone tissue actually contacting other bone tissue. It'll rub raw pretty quickly um, and start getting grainy. There's a, a lot of friction going on there. Partly also as a cushion, um, hyaline cartilage has a lot more water and protein content than bone does, and so it gives a little bit of uh, impact support. The other, uh, fibrocartilage, uh, you know from a couple examples. Anytime the fibrocartilage is used to form a joint, you call it a symphysis. You know the pubic symphysis. I'm holding the anterior portion of uh, the hip together. We also talked about the syntheses between uh, vertebral bodies, so your vertebral discs are symphyses as well. The other one that we mentioned that I told you to you know, pencil in a note about in your joint list is the menisci. Um, one meniscus for the anterior and another for the posterior side of the articulation between the condyles and the femur and the tibia in the knee. So obviously not bone tissue, uh, but important parts of the skeleton. And so be prepared to recognize where you would find those um, different types of cartilage. All right, uh, the information on pages three and four are really just a naming thing. Um, axial and appendicular skeleton is pretty straightforward. And um, classifying bones as long, short, flat, or irregular, also pretty easy. You can see the list here. I put these in the notes because on the exam, um, I may have to refer to them so that I can ask about parts. You know, for example, um, long bones have a particular anatomy where you describe the diaphysis versus the epiphysis. Um, flat bones, like those in the skull, have a different pattern of development when we talk about um, endochondral ossification versus intramembranous. And so I wouldn't really test you directly on, you know, exactly which bone is this and which bone is that as far as, you know, flat, short, and regular go. Uh, but they're important, you know, vocabulary to have in mind when you're um, reading the information further on. All right, one example of that is uh, the next two pages, we're sort of looking at um, zoomed out microscopic anatomy of bone tissue. And so we're not zooming way in and looking at individual osteocytes, but uh, we're just trying to get an idea of what kind of bone tissue is there once you, uh, you know, cut down deeper into the tissue. This is showing you short, irregular, and flat bones. This view is specifically a flat bone. And uh, the general anatomy is pretty uniform. You've got two types of bone tissue. This on either side um, of the structure is compact bone. Everything in the center is spongy. And when we went through uh, bone tissue for exam one, we were talking entirely about compact bone. And so if I jump ahead here a little ways, this structure here where you see osteons and central canals um, and lamella with um, you know, osteocytes sprinkled in, that's very specific to compact bone. And so when you're looking at this anatomy, you would only find those structures here. Right? You would find central canals and osteocytes. Um, or sorry, com spongy bone has osteocytes. You would find central canals and osteons and so forth only in compact bone. If you look at spongy bone, um, 
uh, it's organized very differently. Uh, these sort of strips of bone that are held together in like a spider web sort of lattice work structure, they're called trabeculae. And the purpose is uh, build a three-dimensional structure of bone with a lot of space in the middle, mostly to reduce weight. In order to be structurally sound, the bone has to have a certain amount of thickness to it. But if you make it thicker, it's going to get heavier. And so the compromise is um, put two very solid compact bone plates on the exterior and then put some spongy bone on the interior. That way you get the combination of both um, thickness but not uh, an enormous amount of weight to carry around. If you look at a long bone, uh, things are very different. The epiphyses of a long bone, uh, meaning the ends, right? every long bone will have a proximal epiphysis that's closer to the trunk and a distal epiphysis that's further away from the trunk. And the epiphyses look really similar to a flat bone. You have compact bone all around the perimeter, around the circumference of the tissue, and you have spongy bone in the center. Exact same um, idea as before. You're trying to increase size but minimize weight. And for a long bone, the reason you need a lot of size is these are bones like the humerus, radius, ulna, femur, tibia, and they form joints that have a lot of movement and take a lot of impact. And if you have joints that have to move a lot and receive a lot of impact, you need surface area. If the top of a long bone was thin like this, just like the diaphysis is, it would be essentially like balancing two sticks on top of each other. It really wouldn't work very well at all. And so this broad surface um, on the, the end of the epiphysis, that's to give you a lot of surface area so when the two bones interact with each other, you can distribute the force over um, a lot more tissue. And like we mentioned before, those surfaces are always covered with articular cartilage. Um, that would be hyaline cartilage specifically. This compact bone here is labeled the epiphyseal line. We'll get to bone development a little bit later. For right now, um, the epiphyseal line in an adult is the remnant of the epiphyseal um, growth plate in a child. And so a little later on, when we get to this information, and you see epiphyseal plate, the terminology is when a child or an adolescent is still growing, and there's still cartilage there, you call it the epiphyseal plate. When you're looking at an adult that stopped growing, that cartilage has all receded, it's entirely bone tissue now, and you call it the epiphyseal line. Okay. If we move down into the diaphysis, uh, the diaphysis of a long bone is, um, the bone tissue is entirely compact bone, but it's hollow in the center. And so all of this tissue, you see the cutaway here, this is compact bone. They're showing you central canals here. That's what those little holes are. This space in the center is, um, I shouldn't say hollow, it's filled with bone marrow, but there's no actual bone tissue there. And so this yellow substance that they're showing you, that's yellow bone marrow. And again, um, same purpose as before. You need some thickness, but you don't want too much weight. And so um, the diaphysis of a long bone is almost like a hollow piece of pipe. Give it some thickness, hollow out the center. It wouldn't make sense to try to trap air in the center. Uh, that would be very difficult, like a sinus. And so the solution is um, yellow bone marrow. Yellow bone marrow serves a function that I'll get to in a little bit, and it has to live somewhere, and this makes a nice place to store it. Um, so that space, the, the hollow space in the interior of a diaphysis where yellow bone marrow resides, um, you'll call the medullary cavity. If we zoom in just a little bit closer on um, some of the tissues around the diaphysis, we've got to talk about the surrounding structures. So um, bone tissue, we'll get to the details of in a little bit. For right now, there are two sort of um, you know, fibrous membranes made of connective tissue on a bone. The outer membrane that wraps around the entire surface, the exterior of the bone, it's called periosteum. Peri means surrounding. And it's important for a few reasons. One is um, it's a very thick, fibrous connective tissue. And so it serves as an important anchor for tendons and ligaments. Uh, we talked about this in class. Tendons and ligaments are made out of um, their connective tissue. They're made almost entirely out of collagen. Uh, 
This periosteum, also connective tissue made almost entirely out of collagen. And so it's very easy when you want to attach a tendon or a ligament to tie the tendon into that periosteum. The big benefit there is that means that you don't have to really directly anchor the tendon into the bone. If you hook it to the periosteum, which wraps all the way around the circumference of the bone, it's almost like you're wrapping a sleeve or a rope around the bone instead of having to anchor it to the surface. And that makes for a much stronger connection. Uh, the other important thing is the, the tissue, the periosteum contains osteogenic cells. Um, genic, like genesis, meaning to create an osteo for bone. So these are essentially bone stem cells that can start replicating and differentiating to form new bone tissue. This is important, um, very important during childhood growth, but equally important during adulthood when a lot of bone remodeling occurs. When bones are stressed, when they're twisted or compacted, when tendons and ligaments pull and yank on them, um, they'll have to remodel themselves subtly, but um, importantly, to accommodate that stress. And we'll talk about the details of that more later. But anytime the exterior of a bone is being built up, or in some cases um, torn down, that's uh, the cells in the periosteum doing the work. The endosteum is much, much thinner. It's microscopic. Uh, you can't, and if they drew it here, it would be inaccurate. But it's lining the entire interior surface of a bone. And so you would find it covering the trabeculae of spongy bone. You'll find it covering the medullary cavity um, in a long bone. And it doesn't serve as any sort of attachment site, obviously, because it's on the interior. But it does contain those same osteogenic um, cells that can remodel bone tissue, this time from the inside. Um, an example of this is during childhood growth, um, cells in the endosteum will differentiate into um, osteoclasts to break down tissue to make the medullary cavity get larger. At the same time, stem cells in the periosteum would be becoming osteoblasts to build more tissue to make the exterior bigger. Um, and that's how a bone can grow thicker without necessarily um, keeping the medullary cavity the same size. Okay, so a little bit more on bone marrow. Two major types. Um, red, bo red bone marrow is found almost entirely in spongy bone. That means in flat bones and in the diaphyses of long bones. In, or sorry, excuse me, in the epiphyses of long bones. Um, yellow bone marrow is found entirely in the diaphyses, in the shaft, the medullary cavity um, of long bones. And the function of yellow bone marrow is fairly simple. It's almost entirely fat, and so it's a storage site for fat-soluble nutrients, things like vitamin A, vitamin D, um, you know, things that you can keep for the long term that don't always wash out with water through the kidneys, like um, water-soluble vitamins, like vitamin C, for example. Red bone marrow um, will spend... Uh, more time in ANP2 in the cardiovascular section talking about its important um, importance in blood cell differentiation. And so these hematopoietic stem cells, um, hemato like heme, these stem cells produce uh, red blood cells, the precursors of platelets, and also all white blood cells. And so um, those cell types have to be kept at homeostasis. If you lose some blood, you have to make more. Um, red blood cells, I told you for our first exam, die quickly and have to constantly be replaced. And so the idea here is, in this bone tissue, all sorts of hormonal signals um, are signaling these hematopoietic stem cells to take different routes and differentiate. The vast majority of them will take this route and become red blood cells, but a smaller and very carefully controlled number will take different routes to become different types of white blood cells. And when we get to blood and the immune system, we'll get into more detail about that. All right, the progression here is we're zooming in further and further. And so this is just reminding you of things that you should really already know. This is microscopic anatomy of compact bone. Microscopic spongy bone is, is kind of boring. There really isn't a rigid structure to it the way that there is in, in compact bone. You saw this back in exam one, but just a quick reminder, if you cross-section compact bone, you'll see these circular units. Um, each entire unit is an osteon. The cavity at the center of each osteon is a central canal. Uh, I would like you to know that the purpose of that central canal is a passageway for both blood vessels and nerves. Uh, 
bone tissue isn't inert. It doesn't just sit there and do nothing. It's dynamic, and so it requires a lot of blood flow. And those blood vessels will then branch out through smaller passageways, those canaliculi. Um, I, I guess I shouldn't say the blood vessels branch out. The fluid from those blood vessels will be pushed through canaliculi to feed these osteocytes. Right? Each of these little cells is one osteocyte. On the real histology, you see over here, these little black spots, those are osteocytes. There's your central canal right in the center, and this entire structure would be one osteon. As bone is formed, it's deposited in these circular structures, and so um, the canaliculi are radiating outward like this. The circles, layers that go this way, almost like tree rings, um, those are called lamella. Uh, and you should be prepared to see a picture like this and, and label that anatomy um, on the lab part of the exam. All right, uh, zooming in further, this is about as far as we can go. Uh, we're talking about actual tissue composition at this point. And bone tissue is made out of two big categories of material. Uh, you can split it into organic and inorganic. And organic really means um, either things that are alive, like cells, or carbon-containing molecules, like protein. And that means that the organic components include um, all the cell types that we've talked about, um, stem cells, osteoblasts, osteoclasts, etc. Um, also, a very large amount of what's called osteoid. And it's basically a mix of mostly protein, a little bit of carbohydrate. The bulk of it is collagen. Uh, you've seen collagen in a lot of the connective tissues that we went through in exam one, and bones have very large amounts of collagen too. The purpose is uh, collagen has very different properties than minerals. So I'll just contrast the two. Uh, if about one-third of bone mass is osteoid protein, the other two-thirds is minerals, mostly calcium phosphate. And the way that this works is collagen fibers form sort of a meshwork, if you imagine them crisscrossing like this. And then uh, calcium phosphate is just deposited right, as mineral within that framework. I can't make enough dots here to actually make it look solid, but it's not that they're two separate things. The collagen network serves as sort of a three-dimensional spider web, if you want to think of it that way. And then you pack the spaces in between with minerals. The purpose of this is um, minerals are very, very good at being compressed. Um, think of them like bricks. You can take a brick and stack lots and lots of weight on top of it, and it won't crush. And so when you take, uh, when you jump and land, for example, when you land, you're putting a huge compression force on pretty much um, all the bones of your axial skeleton, your vertebra, all the way down through your hips, um, into the bones of your leg. And those bones can take a lot of compression force, um, hundreds for a, a strong person, even thousands of pounds. Okay? That's what minerals are giving you. On the other hand, if you try to take something rigid like a brick and twist it, um, it'll break and crumble very easily. Right? That's tensile strength. And so tensile strength means um, twisting, pulling, um, which happens in bones. For example, if you think about somebody changing direction really quickly, uh, like an athlete, the bones in their legs will go through a lot of twisting force. If it was pure mineral, um, those bones would snap very easily. And so you have collagen there to give tensile strength when bones are twisted and pulled on, and you have uh, minerals to give compression strength um, when bones are um, compressed and compacted. So for the exam, um, this, is, this is important stuff. I expect you to be able to outline um, these components, what you would find where, and give a description of, of what the benefit of each is um, using terms like tensile strength and compression strength. Okay, the next section that we're getting into, uh, I want to give a quick overview just for a minute. You have uh, two separate topics that we have to discuss here. Uh, one is bone development. Uh, slides um, 11, 12, and 13 um, in the notes that I have open right now are covering development. We're talking about almost entirely fetal development. So this is happening before birth. Um, 
the end of it happening somewhat after birth, but we're mostly talking about gestation. When we get to the information on postnatal growth, that's a separate topic. A very common mix-up that students have on exams is they get development versus growth sort of swirled around in their mind. And so if I ask you a question about one or the other, make sure you can keep them separate. The two types of bone development that we'll talk about are um, endochondral and intramembrous, intramembranous ossification. I'll spend the most time on endochondral. When we get to um, postnatal growth, we'll talk about interstitial growth, which is bones getting longer, and we'll talk about appositional growth, which is bones getting wider. Just make sure um, you can keep those separate in your mind and, and differentiate. So development first. The general process uh, is called ossification. It just, it just means um, turning tissue into bone. And what I mean by that is during development, you don't just form bones from scratch. It's not really possible. And the reason it's not possible, the main one is you just don't have the resources for it. Calcium's the big one. And so during gestation, there's no way that a mother can eat enough calcium in the course of several months, which um, the last two to three months is when the bulk of, of growth of the skeletal system happens. She couldn't possibly consume enough calcium to fuel that much bone growth. Okay. So the solution is, instead of making the skeleton initially out of bone, the majority of it is made out of hyaline cartilage, um, or in the case of intramembranous oss ossification, some fibrous connective tissue. The benefit is twofold. One, um, hyaline cartilage and fibrous connective tissue are both made almost entirely out of protein, which is protein in water. And so eating grams and grams and grams and pounds of calcium is just not possible. You can't get that much. But you can easily eat hundreds of grams of, of protein in a week. Um, if you have a lot of food, you can eat several hundred grams of protein in a day. And so making cartilage and connective tissue very quickly um, is easy and it's fast um, because you have a lot of access to the materials that they're made out of. Doing it with calcium just wouldn't work. The other advantage is hyaline cartilage and fibrous connective tissue are very flexible. And so if you made a rigid skeleton, it would make birth very difficult because uh, obviously babies have to squeeze and compress quite a bit um, to make their way out during childbirth. This is another example of um, a place in this section where there's some physiology and function and explanation. So if you're thinking about you know, the kinds of physiology questions that I would ask on an exam, um, this is a good one to get prepared for. Okay, there aren't a lot of examples of, of this kind of stuff in this section because it's really not all that complicated. This is a good place where um, you can describe the process and then you can outline um, the, the purpose of it. So be prepared to do that. Okay, um, endochondral ossification first. This is almost every bone in your body except the bones of the skull and the, the clavicle. And so you know, 90% of your skeleton, as far as mass goes, is being formed in this way. And the general idea is you're building a template of the bone made out of hyaline cartilage. And so in this um, illustration, uh, the blue tissue is hyaline cartilage, sort of off-white beige tissue is bone. Note that this stage right here is birth. And so everything to the left of that is fetal development. To the right of that, they're giving a generalization of uh, childhood growth. And early on, um, the bone is, I shouldn't say bone, the structure is almost entirely hyaline cartilage. And so you build it out of cartilage and then slowly ossify it, which just means replace some of that cartilage tissue with bone tissue. The first place that that happens, the very beginnings of it, which you can see better right here, the primary ossification center for a long bone, that just means uh, the diaphysis. The shaft is going to start turning to bone first, and then eventually, closer to the time of birth, you're going to start getting bone tissue forming in the epiphyses, right? Call those the secondary ossification centers. And then by the time um, you're into, you know, well into childhood, what you have left is the entire diaphysis has been ossified, the entire center of the epiphyses have been ossified, and you're left with cartilage in two places. One is articular cartilage, which is going to stay there for your entire life, hopefully, 
unless you have terrible arthritis. That's to provide uh, you know, a smooth surface for joints to articulate. You're also going to have epiphyseal cartilage. That's the growth plate, which we'll talk about later when we get to the growth section. That's only going to be there as long as bones are lengthening. And so somewhere in you know, late teenage years, um, that epiphyseal plate will fade, um, the cartilage will start to disappear, and you'll replace it completely with bone tissue. For those other bones, like I mentioned, um, primarily the bones that form um, the cranial bones of the skull, they're so incredibly thin and flat that the hyaline cartilage template just doesn't really make sense. Um, instead of being like a three-dimensional thick structure like a long bone, they're, almost, they're so thin they're almost two-dimensional. And so it makes sense to use um, something a bit more flexible. And the solution is uh, fibrous connective tissue. This is the same tissue that makes up uh, you know, dermis, ligaments. It's just dense irregular connective tissue. And these illustrations don't make it incredibly clear, but you can imagine it. All you're doing is taking a sheet of that connective tissue, um, sort of stretching it across the surface of the brain to make the cranial bone um, precursors. And then eventually, um, osteoblasts will start forming within that connecti connective tissue, um, start ossifying, and this is just showing the end product. You get a thin piece of bone, compact on the outsides, spongy in the center. And it's the same concept, just uh, different tissue, different strategy because of the shape of the bone. All right, that's the end of development. And so we're going to move on to growth. And like I said, we've got two different types. Uh, interstitial growth, the one I'm going to start talking about now, this is growth in length. And like I mentioned earlier, this happens at epiphyseal cartilage, the epiphyseal plate, um, what you know is the, the growth plate. And all that's really happening is those chondrocytes, the cells that form hyaline cartilage tissue, are dividing, they're migrating, they're growing, and then eventually they're being um, sort of replaced. They're dying off and being calcified. They're being replaced by minerals and surrounded by new bone cells. And so uh, these five sort of steps in the process are illustrated pretty clearly on this picture. And the names make sense. Uh, so get familiar with them but they pretty much tell you exactly what's going on. Um, the resting zone is boring. That's just where nothing's happening. Uh, proliferation means growth or cell division. And so these are mitotic cells that are dividing. They function like stem cells. And the idea is just like what happened in the skin back when we talked about um, you know, that constant growth of the epidermis. One cell will divide into two. Right, out of those two cells, one will stay here and continue to be a stem cell that divides. The other will start migrating this way and get bigger and bigger and bigger. Right, that's the hypertrophic zone. Um, hypertrophy just means growth, tissue growth. And so those cells are packing themselves uh, full of more and more contents, getting larger. And eventually, they shift that contents from protein to minerals. And so eventually that tissue calcifies. You can see here those chondrocytes sort of falling apart and dying. Cartilage goes away. You replace it with bone matrix. And eventually new bone cells and the tissues become ossified. And so ossification just means um, turning in um, to new bone tissue. Right? This process will keep occurring. And if I can go back to this picture... What you essentially have happening is this growth plate is producing new bone matrix that way, and this growth plate is producing new bone matrix that way, which essentially pushes the epiphyses further and further apart from each other. And so you're essentially um, you know, putting new layers of bone tissue from the inside out, pushing the ends further away from each other, uh, making the bone longer in the process. All right. uh, the second type of growth is appositional growth, and this is bones getting wider. There are a few different times um, when this has to happen, and one of them is childhood growth, which is what's being shown here. If this is a child's bone, you have a relatively thin layer of compact bone and a relatively small medullary cavity. An adult bone is going to have a thicker layer of compact bone and a bigger medullary cavity. And so essentially what's happening here is what I mentioned before. The periosteum on the outside of the bone is going to have to be adding 
new bone tissue to get wider. But at the same time, osteoclasts on the endosteum are going to have to be removing bone here to make the medullary cavity get larger. And so you're essentially growing from the outside, hollowing out from the inside, and you wind up with um, a thicker bone but a larger hollow space in the center. Right. This is just one example of um, appositional growth. Similar things will also happen in an adult. If you stress a bone um, through exercise or any sort of um, intense physical activity, wherever the bone is stressed and pulled on, um, you'll have appositional growth making the bone thicker there. Uh, this will also come into play when we talk about repair after a break. Periosteum will deposit extra bone tissue around the fracture site to reinforce it, um, you know, trying to ensure that another fracture doesn't happen in the future. All right, so that's how growth actually occurs, the two major ways that it occurs. This slide is just to remind you of what's actually regulating and controlling bone growth. And I don't have time to go into the details on this because you don't really have a background in endocrine system. You'll get that in a and 2 But I just want to remind you that bone growth is almost entirely hormonal. Your endocrine system is coordinating when and to what degree um, bones grow. The major player in all of this during childhood is growth hormone. And so uh, growth hormone surges correspond pretty well with growth spurts. So it makes sense. Um, growth hormone got its name because it stimulates cell division. And that includes at the growth plate. It also includes at the periosteum thickening bones. Uh, thyroid hormone is uh, an important player that doesn't really get much attention unless there's a problem. If there's a thyroid disorder, it can disrupt, disrupt growth. Um, Sex-specific hormones, males and females both have testosterone and estrogen, and so it's not, they're not strictly male and female sex hormones the way that a lot of people describe them, but um, the levels are very different. And so the you know, roughly tenfold higher testosterone levels in males um, lead to the differences in bone um, length, as in height, uh, and also bone thickness that you see in men versus women. Um, estrogens during puberty um, stimulate a similar pattern in, in women. Obviously, their skeletal structure changes in adolescence too, uh, but not quite to the same degree that it does in males. Next topic is um, bone homeostasis in adults. So we're pretty much done with the childhood development, growth, all that business. Now the question is, uh, what happens in an adult whose bone tissue is, um, at least superficially, seems pretty stable? And the answer is, uh, there's quite a bit of movement of, of material in and out of bones, even if your bones aren't really substantially growing or shrinking. And bone homeostasis um, correlates quite a bit with calcium homeostasis, which I'll get to on the next slide. Um, but for right now, just an overview. Your bones are very regularly, um, you know, materials are swapped out. Some calcium is removed here, it's added there. Some proteins removed here, it's added there. And over the course of just a week, um, you can lose, I shouldn't say lose, recycle pretty substantial por portions of your bone tissue. The biggest reason for this is bones are a reservoir for minerals. And so if you haven't eaten a lot of a certain mineral, calcium is the obvious example, um, you'll borrow some from your bone tissue. When you do have a meal that contains calcium, you'll sort of pay it back. The same thing can happen for protein um, and other trace minerals as well. And so bone remodeling is similar to repair, but repair only happens after a break. Um, remodeling happens in all people all the time. Um, even if they're healthy, it's a normal thing. And you can really break it down into two uh, processes. Deposit and resorption are just technical terms for adding and subtracting bone tissue. So deposit means osteoblasts adding new bone matrix. Resorption means osteoclasts removing existing bone matrix. And it's a push and pull kind of thing. And so if you have more deposit than resorption, your bones are growing. And if you have more resorption than deposit, your bones are shrinking or atrophying. It's normal for a person to go through small changes, um, grow a little bit this day, shrink a little bit that day. It all depends on um, what you need to keep homeostasis and what you happen to be uh, eating at the time. Okay. So using calcium as an example, because this is the most important one, you have a very large quantity of calcium stored in your bones. You have a very small amount of calcium circulating in your blood.
but that small amount of calcium is very, very important. And so even though there's a small amount, you have to keep levels controlled very, very tightly. And the hormone that's most responsible for keeping blood calcium levels at homeostasis is parathyroid hormone. Uh, PTH is different, a uh, completely different hormone than thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. And so keep them separate. Uh, the parathyroid gland is a separate organ. Um, this whole thing in the background is the thyroid gland. These little nodules are parathyroid glands. They may sit right next to the thyroid, uh, but it's different tissue, different hormone, different function. And so we're not talking thyroid right now. And the way this negative feedback loop works is uh, parathyroid glands are sensitive to blood calcium levels. And so if blood calcium levels get too low, that's your starting stimulus. Uh, parathyroid gland releases parathyroid hormone, abbreviated PTH. PTH has a couple different functions. One is um, it activates osteoclasts. This makes sense because if your blood calcium levels are too low, you need more. If osteoclasts break down bone tissue, they'll remove calcium from your bone and add it to blood, which will send blood calcium levels back up. Right? It's a negative feedback loop because if blood calcium levels come back up, right, that will inhibit um, the parathyroid glands from releasing more PTH, and so they're inverse. If calcium levels are too low, you expect PTH levels to get high, osteoclasts to turn on. If blood calcium levels are too high, you flip it. You expect parathyroid hormone levels to fall, osteoclasts should turn off. Um, if blood calcium levels are too high, you have two options. Um, option one is um, you could turn on osteoblasts and build that extra calcium back into your bones. This would happen after you eat some calcium. If your bones are, are full, if they're saturated with calcium, um, the rest will just be excreted through the kidneys. So parathyroid hormone also has um, a kidney function. And when we get to, um, well, really both the digestive system and the renal system, the kidneys and AMP2, uh, we'll talk more about that part of it. So for the exam, um, be able to go through this negative feedback loop. If I ask you about calcium levels in the blood that are too high or too low, uh, you know, be ready to go through what the response is. All right. Uh, in addition to mineral homeostasis like calcium, bones also have to keep a certain homeostasis in order to respond to mechanical stress. And I don't have time to go into a lot of really specific examples or details with this, but I want you to get the general concept. Bones can be stressed in different ways. Um, they can be compacted, compressed, they can be stretched, they can be twisted. There are different ways to stress a bone. And the important thing is um, bones will respond to that stress by adapting. And so in the same way that muscles respond to stress by getting stronger or improving their blood flow for more endurance, um, your skin responds to UV stress by releasing melanin and getting a tan. Your epidermis responds to abrasion stress by forming calluses. Bones respond to stress much in the same way. And so this example, this is showing where the hip joint would be you're putting a lot of uh, load on the femur. What that's really trying to do is take this end of the femur and push it down that way. That means um, this half of the bone is actually being compressed, whereas this half of the bone is actually being stressed. And if you look very closely at these two different halves of the tissue, they appear slightly different. Uh, more minerals on this side to avoid compression, uh, more osteoid and protein on that side to avoid um, stretching tension or tensile strength. Okay. And so bones respond to stress. The real question is, um, how much stress do you need to apply to a bone? If somebody, if a patient goes on bed rest or an astronaut goes to zero gravity in the space station and their bones aren't getting any stress, they'll atrophy very, very quickly. Uh, on the other hand, if you put someone in a very intense, very stressful, um, you know, resistance, you know, strength training regimen, their bones will get increased stress and they'll get slightly thicker and denser as a response, which in general is a good thing. And so this model, I introduce it here because it applies, does apply to bones, it applies to a lot of tissues, and it also applies to muscles, which we'll do next. And the idea is um, 
some kind of stress in order to produce a response has to damage the tissue. They're calling it depletion here. If you think of this as the muscle, the stress would be whatever the activity is. And you can all imagine that because you've had the feeling of tired or sore muscles um, after you know, some sort of exercise. With bones, it's no different except you don't really feel it. But after you do something very stressful to a bone, that tissue is damaged a little bit. Right? You'll make very small tears um, or stress fractures, you know, so microscopic that you can't possibly see them or feel them inside bone tissue. And then as a response to that stress, um, eventually you'll repair it. And in a healthy person that has adequate recovery, you'll compensate by getting just a little bit better than you were before. Okay? If you go for a long time without doing it again, um, eventually you'll dip back down. But the idea is if you stress a bone, let it recover, stress it again, let it recover, stress it again, let it recover, eventually you can build up to a higher level than where you were before. Okay? This is just physiological adaptation. Young people, for the most part, uh, don't really need to worry about this, although it would probably be good for them to start thinking about it. But when you're working with older populations that are at a high risk for fracture, um, getting them enough stress to keep their bones strong and adapting, but not so much stress that you cause damage like a, a break or a fracture is sort of a difficult balance to walk. And so getting people involved in um, the kind of um, strength exercise that gets their bones strong when they're younger makes this uh, a much more doable thing when they get older and actually need it most. Okay. Um, what this is showing is this is a clinical trial done to look at um, the impact of resistance training on bone density, and I'll, I'll go through it in more detail in class. For right now, I'll just jump to the graph. The conclusion is, if you want to get bones to respond, um, BMD is bone mineral density, high intensity exercise is the only thing that will work. And when the authors say intensity, that doesn't mean like difficult huffing and puffing, lots of sweating. High intensity in this context means heavy weight. And so, um, a very heavy weight for a short amount of time has a positive effect on bone mineral density, whereas um, lighter weights that are lifted for longer periods of time have either no effect or, if the trend is correct, possibly even a, a negative effect. And so the conclusion is bones need, they have a threshold. There's a certain amount of stress that you have to give them uh, in order to respond. And again, the tricky part is um, in older populations, you need that high intensity to cause adaptation, but you also have to um, be very careful about um, closely monitoring them and make sure they're doing the exercise correctly so that you reduce the risk of injury. Right. Um, this slide I put in here because um, there's a lot of misleading information out there about the relationship between um, body weight or BMI and health. And the common you know, generally proclaimed wisdom is that being skinnier and thinner is better. And for health purposes, especially, again, in older adults, this probably doesn't quite as much apply to younger people. But as you get older, um, being very small is really not a very good thing. And so on this scale, um, this is BMI. Uh, 25, 18 to 25 is considered the range of a healthy weight. Anything between 25 and 30 you're classified as overweight, um, anything above 30, and they'll call you obese. The interesting thing is um, the healthiest place to be as far as just, you know, the ability to stay alive, which is kind of important, I guess, is on the upper end of the healthy range. That's the best place to be. The thing that was surprising is if you take a close look, um, this is the low end of healthy, if you come over here and drag it down, um, people on the lowest end of normal weight, a BMI of 18, have essentially the same risk of death as people that are on the low end of the obese scale, um, a BMI in the low to mid 30s. And part of the, the very likely reason for that is having a lot of extra adipose tissue probably isn't a good thing, but having a lot of bone and muscle tissue, especially as you get older, is a very good thing. And so people on the high end of the healthy range and even into the overweight category, um, part of the benefit that they're getting 
is they probably have um, more bone density and more muscle mass on average. And so if you look at it carefully, um, the goal isn't just to make people lose weight. It's to make them lose a specific kind of weight, mostly visceral adipose tissue. But at the same time, there should be a big focus on trying to get them to increase the right amount of weight, which mostly means skeletal and muscle tissue. All right. If um, bone density is lost to a severe degree, we call it osteoporosis. This is a picture of normal spongy bone versus a bone sample from a patient with osteoporosis. And there are certain places where there's enough spongy bone and bears a lot of weight that you start having a lot of risk of fracture. Um, vertebra and hips are a common example, partly because of um, falls. So when people fall, this is a, you know, the most common point of impact. And so there's a lot of compression strength. And when you lose mineral density, you lose compression strength. And so bones fracture. Preventing osteoporosis is, um, it's, it's fairly difficult if you don't catch it early. The biggest risk factors, um, sadly, are just being old, female, and white. And the, the, the racial um, or ethnic thing isn't entirely clear why Caucasian women are more susceptible to it, um, but it's, um, it's a pretty strong correlation. The other thing is small frame size. So, you know, things that you can't control, obviously, you can't control your age, you can't control your gender, um, and you can't control your, your race or ethnicity. But some of these things you can. So um, small body frame, you can't, I guess, necessarily change your frame size per se, but you can do the right kind of exercise that reinforces um, the bones that you do have to make that, that skeletal frame stronger. This is mostly a product, again, of exercise, which we've already gone through. Diet, um, both calcium and protein are important for building bone matrix. Um, avoiding smoking pretty much reduces your risk of almost every disease imaginable. That also applies to osteoporosis. And so the treatment is usually a combination of a few things. Exercise, calcium, um, getting enough protein in the diet, and often vitamin D, uh, because uh, for reasons we'll get into in AMP2, uh, vitamin D is important for moving calcium um, across the small intestine epithelium. And so even if you eat lots of calcium through supplements, if vitamin D levels aren't where they need to be, um, you won't actually get it into the blood. All right. Next thing is, if someone does actually have a fracture, uh, this next set of information is really just describing that fracture, and then I'll go into you know, very generally how fractures are repaired. And so for any, any break or fracture, you can describe it using three different sets of terms. Every fracture is either displaced or it's not, it's complete or it's incomplete, and it's either open or it's closed. And so if you think of a very extreme break, you know, an athlete snaps their tibia and it's, you know, protruding out the side of their leg. Um, that's very obviously displaced. It's out of alignment. It's complete. It went all the way through the bone. And it's open. It's poking out the skin. On the other extreme, you know, imagine a stress fracture in your foot or your ankle. Um, that is very likely non-displaced because it's just a small stress fracture. It's definitely incomplete because the bone's still intact. And it's definitely closed because uh, your skin's intact. Obviously, um, you can have other combinations. You can have bones that are complete, but they don't go through the skin. Um, you can have bones that are not complete, but there is some displacement. And so to really get a view of more subtle breaks, you would have to look at an x-ray to see exactly where they fall. The other way they can be described is how the actual fracture appears in the bone itself. And I'll just briefly go through these. Um, a comminuted fracture is when, um, usually from uh, compression strength, most often in uh, patients with osteoporosis, bones are put under compression force and they shatter into multiple pieces. Um, the difference between comminuted and compression is kind of vague in general. A comminuted fracture, you generally break into several uh, fairly large pieces. A compression fracture is similar but it's usually crushed into many, many small pieces. Um, you can imagine it almost being like um, you know, little pieces of, gra of gravel or sand coming out of the bone tissue. That makes it much more difficult to heal. And so those two are similar, uh, mostly due to um, 
you know, falls, car accidents, uh, you know, things of that nature. A spiral fracture, this happens uh, almost entirely in long bones in the arms of the legs. Anytime there's a twisting force, if the twisting force is strong enough, the diaphysis of the long bone can create a fracture that spirals up um, through the compact bone around the medullary cavity. This is um, common in a couple places. One is uh, in sports, especially in the tibia, when an athlete plants very quickly to change direction. Um, or if they land um, and their foot plants firmly either into the grass or under the court if they're playing a, an indoor sport, the shoe sticks and so the foot plants but the entire body keeps rotating and that force twists throughout the bone. Um, it can also happen in children. This is a common flag for um, investigating child abuse. If people grab a child, if an adult grabs a child um, and you know, twist their arm, for example, very forcefully, um, that can give a spiral fracture. An epiphyseal fracture happens um, entirely in children because it's a separation of the epiphyseal plate. And so since the epiphyseal plate is made out of cartilage, it's the weak point in a bone for a child. And if they have a large amount of force there, you're essentially separating the, separating the diaphysis from the epiphysis. The good thing about this break is that it heals fairly quickly the bad thing is it can disrupt activity at the epiphyseal plate, and so the bone might not end up being as long as it otherwise would have, and you'll have uh, you know, bones of unequal length from one side of the body to the other. Great. Uh, next one, a depression or depressed fracture. Um, this almost entirely happens in the skull and is entirely due to impact. So again, um, traumas, car accidents, um, you know, sometimes sports accidents, you get hit in the head with a baseball without a helmet on and, um, only happens in the skull because that's really the only sort of flat dome shaped structure you have where it's possible. The last one, um, a green stick fracture. This happens almost entirely in children. Um, children's bones have more protein than mineral. And so their bones are a bit more, um, stretchy and springy than an adult's bone. And so when a long bone gets bent, what ends up happening is just like when you try to break a green stick off of a tree, if the bone got bent that direction, the convex portion will tear, um, the concave portion will stay intact. And again, the good news is um, it heals generally pretty quickly. It's usually not a complete break, that's why it's called green stick, and it's usually not severely out of alignment. And since it's not at the growth plate, it really shouldn't affect bone growth. And so um, fairly common, but usually a pretty minor break that heals pretty quickly. All right, after the break occurs, obviously um, you wanna heal the tissue. And so I'll take you through a, a very brief outline of the repair process. And step one, hematoma is straightforward. Blood is very vascular. Obviously all those central canals carrying blood vessels are gonna rupture when the fracture happens. And if it's not a complete break, meaning, um, I guess I shouldn't say complete. Um, if, it, if it's not severe enough that it ruptures the periosteum, which is being shown as this white connective tissue here, the periosteum is going to contain the blood. Um, that's going to form a hematoma, which essentially just means um, a big swollen clot of blood that forms around the break site. Okay. At some point um, within you know, several days to weeks after the break, that hematoma is going to be replaced by um, a callus. And that callus is formed out of fibrocartilage. The fibrocartilage is, this is kind of similar to the idea with development. You couldn't form a baby's bones immediately because there just wasn't enough calcium and it would be too slow. Same kind of things happening here. Fibrocartilage is made out of protein and it can be formed very quickly. And so as a placeholder, you'll fill in all of this tissue with fibrocartilage it's thick enough that it can generally hold the bone in place. It's not rigid enough to be permanent though. Okay? And so you'll quickly um, make a, a placeholder of fiber cartilage. And then eventually over time, just like you did with that endochondral ossification process, you'll slowly replace the cartilage with new bone tissue. The cartilage formed quickly, you know, over the course of a couple weeks. Bone tissue forms much more slowly 
that's going to take several months. What you end up with is a bony callus that's not um, a perfect version of what should be there long term, but it's strong enough to give the bone support and, and hold everything in place. The last step is um, the last example of bone remodeling that I'll give you. Right? In this previous example, you had spongy bone all throughout the break site. By the end of it, you want to make it look like the original. Compact around the outside, hollow in the center. And so that remodeling just means making it match the original. You want um, compact bone where it originally was. You want spongy bone where it originally was and open spaces like the medullary cavity also in place. All right, uh, the last thing that I'm going to do on this video is give you a brief overview of joints. And the biggest thing that I want you to want to remind you of for the exam is make sure you keep the categories separate. Uh, joint anatomy and joint names are going to be a substantial part of the lecture exam, and so it's a pretty important part of your grade. Make sure that you can keep them separate. Fibrous joints are sutures and syndesmoses. I told you not to worry about teeth and gomphoses. And so you should be able to give examples. Uh, you know, sutures, pretty much the only place that we uh, describe them are in the cranial bones of the skull. Um, syndesmoses, ligaments holding joints together like the tibia to the fibula. And they're called fibrous because they're made out of fibrous connective tissue. Right? Um, and the important thing to note here is these joints barely move, um, if any. Sutures don't really move at all. Cartilaginous joints... Um, easy enough, they get their name because they're made out of cartilage. You should pair um, synchondroses with hyaline cartilage. Easy examples of that, um, the ribs, costal cartilage. The bone of your rib doesn't actually touch the bone of the sternum. They're connected by hyaline cartilage. It is a joint, though. Um, there is some movement there, but it's minimal. So when you uh, inhale and exhale, for example, you will have some uh, movement of that cartilage tissue but it's not anywhere near what a synovial joint would be. Syntheses, on the other hand, are made out of fibrocartilage, with, which has different properties. Um, fibrocartilage is very good at handling um, both compression and tensile strength, um, but it's soft enough to act like a shock absorber. And the two examples that we gave of where you would find it, actually three, um, the pubic symphysis, uh, discs, the fibrocartilage uh, vertebral discs between vertebral bodies, and we also mentioned the meniscus and the knee being made out of fibrocartilage. And so make sure you keep those paired with cartilaginous joints. Those two are completely separate from synovial joints. And for synovial joints, you should be able to name all the individual synovial joints that are on your lab list. You should also be able to give a, a general description of the anatomy, which you can see here. All right. uh, the most important things, one, obviously... Uh, we talked about it in class. They're called synovial joints because the joint is really a cavity filled with synovial fluid. And the fluid is just a lubricant to try to reduce friction between the surfaces of articular cartilage at the joint. Remember, not bone on bone. should always be hyaline cartilage to hyaline cartilage. The articular capsule is essentially just the container that holds everything in place. Every time you move a joint, that fluid is pressurized, and you don't want it to just squirt out. And so this fibrous layer acts like a container to keep synovial fluid trapped inside the joint. The synovial membrane is just the epithelial layer that's producing synovial fluid. It does leak out at some slow rate, and so those cells have to be constantly making um, more synovial fluid to replace what was lost. Okay. Last thing, um, synovial joint types. These are subcategories, and they're based on structure. We went through this in a lot of detail on your lab list, which I can't really pull up in the video right now, so I'll leave this for in class. But just remember, if I ask you what type of joint, um, for example, the humero-ulnar joint is, which is shown here, um, it is a hinge joint, that's true, but it's a synovial joint. And so hinge is just a subcategory of synovial. The last thing to remember is don't mix up the type of joint with the type of movement. And so the humero ulnar joint in the elbow, it's a synovial joint. It is a hinge joint. Um, that's just naming the structure. Flexion and extension are the movements. And so the humero ulnar joint can flex and extend. That's what it does. 
it is a hinge. And I won't go out of my way to trip you up on that, but just try to keep those ideas separate in your mind. Okay. Alright, so from here on out it's pretty much uh, straightforward anatomy and um, we should have time the day before the exam to review that in quite a bit of detail. Since I can't pull up real bones and move them back and forth to show you joints and parts, um, that's probably best saved for class.